institutionalized at this point. Uh, I have also worked in every educational setting you could possibly imagine. I have started infant programs, and I've been a graduate student advisor to a 72-year-old master's student. And I've worked at every single place in between, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges, universities. Um, and so I'm proud of that, I'm proud of the fact that I've been a practitioner in education for a long time. I see great hope and promise in open learning. So it's one thing that I'm very excited about. And we've started some experiments in open learning at St. Francis Xavier University. I've also started open learning at my two other institutions that I've worked with. I've worked in Canada and Australia and the United States. Uh, and both of those were, uh, they didn't work perfectly the first time. But uh, we're hoping to get a few things right this time and just keep going on the journey. Really excited to learn from everyone and all the speakers here uh, today. Uh, I do hold a great hope for open learning, uh, but I suspect that it will be co opted by universities, dismantled by universities, marginalized by universities, uh, and will end up in the same places we always have been. So that's mostly an optimistic take and a pessimistic take. We can decide which one we want to. Want to go with uh, talk. My guiding question today is really before we get into open education programs, should we revisit, should we rethink, should we redescribe the purpose of higher education and the purpose of our institute? And I think the answer to that is yes. End of talk. Um, however, I think there is a really good reason why we should think about that first before we jump in. And when I say first, well, that's silly, isn't it? I mean, open learning has been around forever. Uh, it's, not, it's not a new thing, but I do think that we should really think about purpose. Yeah. Um, and the definition of higher education, does it also include vocational education? Yes. Yeah. I would say education. Okay. Any, yeah. any sort of education for me, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. So, in the room, are there faculty in the room? Who's a, now, this could be like faulty towers. You know, in faulty towers, you can be multiple. You can be every one of these different things. But there's, there's faculty in the room. Beautiful. Um, administrators in the room. All oh, nice. The stick with the A. It's the stick with the A. means provost, et cetera. That's good. Um, instructional designers. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, faculty developers. People that work with faculty to help them learn how to teach. Teach more nice. But students. Yes, because it's too low. Um, librarians. I'm librarians. Oh. Um, and I always ask, you know, I, I don't think I will ask this today, but we're short on time. You just start by talk by asking people if they have anything to play up. It's not really, you know, you get that at the end of the time. Uh, sure. So the modern uh, Higher Education Institution uh, was founded by a bad roommate here. There was a, a gentleman uh, in the 1500s at the University of Paris, and his name was Francis. Uh, lovely gentleman, wonderful scholar, and living his best life, I will say, too. Uh, he was uh, and, uh, living his best life because he had a double dorm room, and he had it all to himself. So his roommate had left, and he's at the University of Paris in the 1520s, um, and just enjoying the nightlife in Paris. Uh, and then one day, 
the rector came to his door and knocked and, and said, uh, Francis, I have a roommate for you. <coughs> Trumbled a little bit. He said, no, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll like this. You'll like this guy. He's great. He's from Spain, too. He said, oh, perfect. His name is Ignatius, and he's going to be your roommate. So in, in hobbled and actually bounced in um, a gentleman named Ignatius, and Francis hated him. Couldn't stand him, because Ignatius was overly optimistic about everything, incredibly cheerful. And so Francis thought, my life is, is, is a mess now. No more fancy nights out in Paris. Um, I'm going to be spending my days with this gentleman who is overly keen about everything. Um, and so Ignatius told his story, and that was that he wanted to be a soldier. His whole life, all he wanted to do was dream about being a warrior. Uh, and that he, he prepared himself for this moment. And in his first battle, in the first five minutes, he was struck with a cannonball and was laid out and had to convalesce in his home back in Spain. And he was looked after by his sister. And it was a long convalescent period, a couple of years before he could really walk properly again. And the only book that he could read, the only open education resource that he had, uh, that he could read was in Spanish. And it was the story of Jesus. All the other books in his house he could not read because they were Latin. And he was reading the story of Jesus, and he thought, this is the toughest guy I have ever heard of in my life. And from that moment, he devoted his life to spreading this word of this tough guy, this warrior who he read in his book. And so he decided to go to the University of Paris and study Latin. And slowly but surely, and slowly but surely, he won Francis over. And that's how St. Francis Xavier and St. Ignatius of Loyola, in that dorm room at the University of Paris in the 1520s, invented modern higher education. Between the two of them, they started hundreds of colleges and universities around the world. And really, the modern day higher education institution are those conversations writ large. Um, and I think what they did was they looked at the purpose of higher education and the purpose of education in general, and how can we disseminate this fantastic idea. So if we look at the words we might describe to the modern university, if you will, I wonder what words we would use to describe it today. And I, I decided to find a recent article about the modern university by a scholar from the United States, of all places, um, who had written a recent article in the Atlantic, was it? Um, and he described modern higher education as Hill Colleges for high school graduates, advanced, advanced schools, research centers, professional schools, extension institutes and continuing education, and athletic and social organizations. Now you'll notice, I won't read his, his, his dribble that he wrote in Atlantic, I want to um, but he didn't have to be as polite, apparently, back in uh, 1925 when he wrote this article about the modern university. And you'll see that, really, as he describes the modern university in 1925, it's not much different from the university in 2023. Uh, and when that happens, you see, we are embedded <coughs> into a system. We are involved in a system that is perpetuating itself again and again and again. Um, and I think that the tragedy of, of the world, and perhaps the tragedy of the land is, is the fact that we are not here to think in terms of systems. We are here to think in a very reductivist manner, uh, and but yet we live in a systems world. And I think that will ultimately destroy us. Although I do have a uh, hope through hyperpower. This morning, is it hyperpunk? Oh, punk. Whatever you like. Hyper oh, punk, hyperpunk. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Perhaps this is a way out. Perhaps this is the spontaneous way out uh, to redefine the system. I had an epiphany sitting there this morning. It's so wonderful. Um, but I think this is the issue. And I think we need to understand higher education 
education in general, perhaps, and how we might be able to change it the way those two gentlemen uh, sitting in the University of Paris in the 1520s did. Maybe we should think about uh, universities and education from a systems lens. That's what uh, Kate Rayworth did when she looked at economics from a systems lens and, and wrote the book Donut Economics. And I actually tweeted to Kate Rayworth, and I said, Kate, yeah, I just read your book. It's fantastic. I said, did you ever read uh, Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows? And she says, we idiot. That's exactly where I got the idea for Donut Economics. It's so wonderful. And so I said, I should write a book of croissant tech and education, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Educator uh, by Jack Rice. How do you how do you written that one just yet? But uh, there might be some time up for five minutes. So things that we need to think about when we think about systems. I hear all the time at my university the system is broken. Systems are not broken. The system of higher education since 1520 and since the last hundred years is producing the same outcomes. It is not broken, it is perfect. It is a system perfected. It is doing the exact job that we've programmed it to do. And so if the outcomes are not what we want, we need to somehow shift that system in a way. And we typically use ways to shift that system that have no impact at all on the system at, uh, at, at all. So one of the things that we try to do in systems or in, in higher education is to switch out the people, change out every single university president, every single provost, every single faculty member. It has no effect. That has no effect on system performance. If you change all 11 players of the Scottish national football team, and you came back a year later, they would still be playing football. Now, they might make a few more penalty kicks than the last 11 did, but essentially you would look upon the game and it would not have changed at all. So when we try to change individual components, we do not affect the system. System results may be altered by creating new rules. And so we do this sometimes in education. We create some new rules for things. It typically, uh, especially a long-standing system does not have much in effect. We'll, we'll change the rules for tenure and promotion at my university. Believe me, we'll find a workaround for that. Any rule that you impose on a system can pretty much be found is a workaround for that. <laughs> and lastly, I would say that a better way, a better tact, is to actually examine the purpose of the system. And this is where I go back to my guiding question. Why? Why is what is the purpose of higher education and, and education in general? If you change that purpose, you will create new feedback loops to actually deliver that purpose. The reason that outcomes in education are inequitable, are racist, is because that's what we designed it for. We designed it to produce those kinds of unequal, unfair results. So could we design it for something else? I think that's a possibility to live into. Uh, but we have to attack it at the purpose level. So I'm going to propose four changes that we could make to education and higher education in light of open learning. Because I believe that open learning plays into uh, this a, a great effect. So one, could the purpose of education be to fully realize human potential, both at the individual level and in the aggregate. I believe that is a completely different purpose for education and higher education. And I think open learning is potentially a solution uh, that could help us get to that kind of new, new purpose, a new paradigm uh, for education. Uh, one of my favorite moments in my educational journey was a time period where I got to be involved in a Montessori school. Uh, you hear Montessori school? Yeah. So if you write Jack Rice Montessori, you probably need that one on the internet somewhere. Um, but I believe that that's really what she did. If she was trying to unlock human potential. Because the problems that we have of tomorrow 
So we're going to require the best of every single one of us. And not only each one of us individually, but thinking in terms of the aggregate as a collective. So how do we enable that? Give open learning is something to say about it. We have to divorce ourselves from our obsession with the credit and its arbitrage value. So in higher education, and here's an example that happened to me quite recently. Someone from a peer institution of mine, and our institution kind of collaborates with some of these other schools, came to me and said, I would like to produce uh, some material on 21st century classrooms. I uh, said, so, oh, that's wonderful. I love that. So we thought about it, and we created the idea, and we rumbled around it. And she said, I don't know where to house this. And I said, I know where we're going to house it. We're going to house it on my open learning platform that I have. This is an idea that what the cost is in total $5,000 to produce. Let's produce it. Let's put it on the open learning platform. Well, shortly after, um, a year later, a year later, a month later, she came to me and said, uh, great news. I have absolutely great news. My university has picked it up as a three credit course. Not only that, but they are going to buy any student that takes this class an iPad. And I said, oh, really? That's, that's what this idea has become? Oh, this is amazing. We're going to have 30 students take this class at $1,500 for each student, but they'll all sign up for it because they get three credits on an iPad. And I think systems thinking. We haven't really attacked this at the purpose level. We haven't made it open. And because of that, this great idea will diminish, wither away, uh, and eventually die when there's no funding in it. You have to remove the clock from education. There's two things that I've learned in my life. Number one, and this is more important, never wake a sleeping baby. If a baby is sleeping, never wake that baby up. It's very not part of it. Uh, and the second is never stop a learner who's learning. Why do we do this? Every single moment you put the clock on education, you have this. <laughs> Ten minutes to complete this exam. Five minutes to finish this speech. You have three months to complete this course. It's madness. So again, we have to th rethink the purpose of education. <laughs> Why are we here to put these artificial time limits on learning? So open learning has a, has a potential solution to that. I have a feeling, though, that it will be redirected, co-opted, marginalized, and spit out the system of higher education. So you have to be quite forceful in these things when you think of open education. If you're creating open education and you're putting time limits on it, I don't think you're, uh, you're fixing much. Um, and then we have to decentralize the role of assessment. I did the walk yesterday, and there was a gentleman from the GoGN network here, and I debunked every single one of his arguments in the 35 minutes we walked it down of why we need assessment in education. Um, and I think he's still recovering today. I saw him at the bar earlier this morning. So, um, but, you know, we are so focused on the credit. We're so focused on evaluating and assessing learning, we just forgot the openness and the joy of it uh, as well. So if we're involved in open learning, we have to fight. We have to fight tooth and nail to preserve that. So these are my four uh, changes that I would make to higher education when we consider the role of open learning. Um, and I have... I have to kill more. I just don't know what they are. Um, so this is program. <clears throat> I suppose I could have uh, memorized it. <laughs> more, four more. Four <laughs> suggestions. Uh, I once asked a faculty member uh, who was creating their courses a year, I said, have you ever taken any of the students' classes? And 
She said, what are you talking about? I said, you know, the students' classes. You've published your roster of classes that the faculty make. I know I have a big book of them. It's online. Well, have you ever looked through all of the courses that the students teach? Well, you really should. Why don't you go to the catalog of student-led courses? And you should probably take one or two of those. Of course, there are no student-led courses at my university. Um, she never got back to me, so I assume that she didn't find them on the catalog anywhere. But if we are truly an open learning experience, why is it only people over the age of 43 that get to teach classes? I think one of the first things a student should be able to do when they attend the university is teach a class. Open up a Moodle site. Teach me something, right? If it is a learning community, there has to be an open exchange. And I don't think it will be open learning until we build the dialogue. I often get the question, I am in charge of, of online learning and professional studies, and I get the question all the time, Jack, how much learning should he unlock? And I said, well, that is a great question. I do not know the answer to that question, but I, I believe I can tell you how much learning is online currently, like right now. And they said, oh, really? I said, 100%. You cannot disentangle technology today from learning. It is impossible to do. <laughs> it is impossible to do. We have rewired humanity in this way. Um, we need to continue. There's no pausing. There's no getting off. That does not mean we shouldn't get together. I came all the way to Inverness to get together with all of you. But when I think about this conference, be it a pencil, paper, or whatever, um, I will be learning a lot. There will be a digital aspect to it. I cannot like, divorce myself from um, If education does not support wellness, what's the point? Um, we need to um, elevate the advising function um, at our universities. Um, and classes have to focus on community building, uh, and the intellectual multiplier effect. If I learn something in isolation and I don't pass it on, again, it's getting a complete waste of time. So how do we create open learning experiences so people are engaged to pass on uh, what they learn? Oh, there we go. So here's my hope and dreams for open learning in my last three minutes. When the university says to you, like what's going on here with open learning. Let's define it. Let's put some definitions around it. Um, let, let's regulate it. You know what? Let's give it a budget. Let me give you three more people and a seat on set. Tell them to get lost. Tell them to get stuck. Because that is, they are buying you. Stay in the margins, stay queer, stay punk. Um, and, and stay off the grid as much as you possibly can. Um, bring on community partners. I work with community partners all the time to bring them on and share out open learning. I'm not as interested in working with my faculty unless they are interested. They may come to me if they would like to work on an open learning project. If they don't, that's fine too. I have a community out there that I can reach and I can work with. Um, curate community at all time. Um, if two people get online or meet in person and they don't make a friend within the first couple of weeks, I will get at least one. So curate community constantly. Balance the credit mandate. Again, why does it's as if they think that the credit oozed out of the primordial soup? You know, there was bacteria and then there was uh, plankton, and then the next step was oh. Oh, look, the university credit, yes, 15 hours of triple credit. Is we made all this stuff up. It's just getting in the way. Um, build a like-minded team of scoundrels around you. I came here to find more scoundrels. Um, and I think I'm in the right place. Um, think in terms of scale and understand that what we're building, the value is it in the end of the pieces and that we're learning it, it is the platform. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. We do have uh, two or three minutes um, before we need to move into the next session. So, are there any questions for Jack? Oh, no. 
Yes, rest in peace. Yes. Hi, hi, Jack. Again, we met yesterday. I know you're not from the US. I made that mistake. Uh, I'm Chrissy from uh, the University of Leeds. Um, very interesting what you say is um, all of it. And I like the storytelling part uh, at the beginning as well, which draws people in and, and it did me personally. Um, one question about um, one thing you said about um, I work with those who want to work with me, basically. So what would university leaders say about this? I'm wondering when we have, you know, uh, often challenge on making institutional change happen, etc. So how can we be so selective in our approach? Great, great question. So one project that we're working on at my university is creating an open education platform for international um, healthcare workers in Canada. So that will scale very quickly. There are about ten thousand of them. And so what we've done is created this platform and portal for them all to get on and meet each other, create a community of practice, um, take some courses, but university credit for it or not, all of it is free, but it's paid for by Healthcare Nova Scotia. Right? So I have made the most money off of things in education that are free. And so university leaders go, Jack, keep going, keep going. This is wonderful. So I do try to um, engage with my university leaders. Most of the time they don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, so they let me loose with a little bit of freedom. But you have to show results. And for me, I think results is the scale, is the platform, is the size. And when I start to see people coming on mass, university leaders get excited, whether they should be or not. They might be thinking it for a different purpose than I am. But when they see people in the beach, um, they get excited. We have another question, so we'll take this one just while we get Jack set up. So, yeah, yeah Jack, uh, Lucas Johnson, uh, Lincoln University in Ontario, 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 Canada. Um, curious about uh, your decentralizing assessment. I, I think that the system is very much adhered towards objectives and, and achievement. And I'm just wondering what that looks like in your mind on how you sort of mark progress. Is it is it peer-based or self-based, um, and I'm, I'm not for the checks and balances, you know, I, I teach an engagement-based course where students sort of choose their own adventure, pick their grade at the beginning, hand in whatever they want to get the mark they want. They get full marks if they hand it in right. and hit the criteria, but I'm, I'm curious what that assessment looks like and how we shift away from students that come up in a system where some might argue that it's like almost gamified, that, you know, they just are trying to accomplish the task that the instructor wants. So. How do we help students find their way in learning with a decentralized assessment system, I guess, is where I'm going. Yeah, good question. Uh, we should come on the walk yesterday. I'll walk <laughs> all the way back if you like tonight. But um, so I, I'm also apparently now the interim coordinator of the Teaching and Learning Center at St. Fets because they had an open call and nobody wanted to do the job. So uh, I was like, okay, I'll do that one too. Um, so here's the one thing that I talked to faculty about in recent meetings. I said, have you ever thought of just talking to the students? Like just opening up the Zoom room, saying, hello, how are you? I noticed that in the second line when you stated your thesis, you said this, this, and this. How did you come up with that? Like try to chat GPT back, mm -hmm. right? In the middle of, just talk to them. Just have a conversation. Do you know how many classes that I sit in at the university and I put on my, like, I, I, my watch and I go, you know, what, when was the first question that's going to be asked? It's a forever. So ask questions, talk to them, record them, create artifacts, build portfolios. Um, I think it's I think it's all there for us, and you have the technology to do it. Um, it's just be great. Breaking down the scrums to close the hundred students classrooms. I think that the class sizes, right? Is a I, I love the approach, and I agree with it. But sometimes first year you get. 200 students in class. 200 is nothing. Yeah. I can have a conversation in two minutes and assess whether someone has done the done reading or not. Yeah. We'll have to go through those Apologies. Oh, that's that's not except for time. But Jack, yeah. like Jack, what's going on? So far, we've got a short change of memory at the end. So we'll run a minute or so late. Make sure that Jack will get started. Is that uh, one minute time for the session? So, Jeffrey, over to you. Please. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Elkner. I'm a high school community college teacher living and working in Arlington, Virginia. Um, I have two quick questions before I start. Um, how many people here are familiar with the GPL? Okay. And the other question is, how many people are familiar with the Python programming language? Oh, okay. So um, I've got a half hour, and I'm hoping I can talk for the latter part of that. So I'm going to go into the slides, uh, hopefully in 15 minutes, and give you some context. So I'm here to share an OER fairy tale, because back in 1999, Open Educate, before it was even a thing, Open educational resources touched my life and charmed to me, and I've been living with enchanted things happening in my life ever since. Um, and what happened then was Helen Downey wrote a book called How to Think Like a Computer Scientist, and he released it under the GPL. So since people were not familiar with the GPL, how many people here know about the Creative Commons? Okay, so this is so the GPL stands for the GNU Public Lectures. And it comes from the free software movement. And it's also known as copyleft. And the idea of copyleft is copyright turned upside down. And in 1993, when I was enrolling in a grad program in computer science, I discovered the GPL and I fell in love. Because immediately I recognized that the GPL was an attempt to decommodify learning. And I was seeing the horrors of commodification of everything everywhere. And I just thought, oh, this GPL is just the most wonderful thing. And I got involved in the free software movement at that time. And so I was coming to OER actually as a computer teacher involved in the free software. And so Helen Downey's book was released under the GPL because there wasn't no great. And he designed this, it was a, it's a wonderful book. Um, he designed it with these goals in mind. He wrote it for his students. So he wanted to keep it short because he thought it was much better for students to read 10 pages than to not read 50. And if many of you have looked at some of the commercial computer books and you've seen them, they're tomes that they have to republish every couple of years so that there's a new edition so they can sell you yet another book. And they don't really enhance learning in any particular way. Um, be careful with the vocabulary, minimize jargon, and define each term. So build gradually and focus on programming, not the programming language. Now, he wrote this book for a course he was teaching, and he used Java as the programming language. So this was a book written to teach programming, but using Java. Meanwhile, down in Arlington, Virginia, I was teaching high school computer science for Arlington Public Schools. And I was confronted with a problem. I already mentioned the, the GPL and my love for free software. Um, I was desperately looking for a new program. And I'll explain why I was looking for a new program. Because there's this thing called the advanced placement computer science that we have in the US. It's, it's a, Standardized tests that students take across the country to get college credit while they're in high school. And so it's called AP. Um, and AP Computer Science used a programming language called Pascal. It was a wonderful language for teaching people to program. But in 1998, they actually switched to C++, which was a, is a terrible language for teaching people to program. So, so I was stuck. What am I going to do with my first year students? Because we were offering AP in the second year. I can't possibly use C++ as the first year. <laughs> I need something else. And Pascal is kind of showing his age. And I'm connected to the free software movement. So what should I do for a new program? And I chose Python. And I chose Python for a number of reasons, and, I'll, and, and uh, more people were familiar with Python than they were with the GPL. But Python, when I started, was a small little community of programmers. And Python is just this magical language that people say you come for the language and you stay for the community. It's a, it's a programming language by programmers for programmers. It was built in the open source environment. 
people who created the language were making it for themselves. And they built this wonderful community. And uh, this is Michael McClay, who is a scientist who was working at, at, at NIH. Um, and he helped bring Leo von Rossum, the creator of Python, over to the Virginia area. So actually, they all came from right, right near where I live. And they started growing this Python. And Python is easy to write, easy to read, and it has it's, it's like one of the most local or high ceiling, a lot of great reasons why Python is a wonderful language to be programmed with. And so I chose that language because I had met Michael McClay at a Linux install fest in 1995 at NIH, where I was bringing my computer to try to get Linux working on it. And he was raving about this language, Python. But at the time, Pascal was working just fine, didn't need to make a change. So I said, oh, I, I, I absorbed his enthusiasm, but I, I didn't have a need. But then in 1999, I had a need because C++ was a nightmare. So what am I going to do? I went back online, and a whole bunch of people said, oh, you should just use Python. You should use Python. So, and then I asked a student of mine, uh, at Matt Ahrens, who was a senior, I said, Matt, can you check out this new language and let me know what you think about it? And he did this for a senior project, and he came back to me raving. He said, I could do more in, with Python in three months than I could with C++ in two years. So I was hooked at that point, and I spent the summer right after that saying, I'm going to learn Python, and I'm going to teach starting next year with Python. But there was a problem. There were no books to teach Python with. Um, there were only a couple of books, a handful of books that even existed in 1999 with Python. Here's pictures of them. And, and they were all about the language, not about programming. So, which makes total sense. I mean, it was a small language community, and they had written some books for programmers who wanted to learn a new language. But I needed a book to teach beginners how to program. So what am I going to do? Well, Richard Stallman, the father of the free software movement, I was involved in the, I had emailed him back and forth, and he introduced me to Alan Downey. He said, Alan Downey has this book, How to Think Like a Computer Scientist. Took a look at it. It's a wonderful book. And while I don't feel like I can write a textbook on my own to start out with at this point, I can take Alan Downey's book and turn it from a Java book into a Python book. And for people who know programming, that's not so hard to do. I mean, computers do what computers do, and programming languages all are working on the same machine. So they're not that different. And here I had a book with a bunch of topics and questions, and all I had to do was rework it from a Java book into a Python book. And because of that, and because he had released it under the DPL, I had the rights to do it. So I did. And what happened next was really pretty amazing for both Alan and I. I mean, we, we ended up meeting online. It was years later we finally met at a Python conference. But um, I converted the book into Python. He's now the author of dozens of books that O'Reilly publishes and everything. And um, in the introduction to his Think Python, which is the latest iteration of, of this book, he said he had the strange experience of learning a new language by reading his own book. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Um, so what basically, we were doing this three years before OER, the term was coined, and it just, because we were at the right place at the right time, Python was exploding as a language. I mean, it went from a little tiny community to being the most popular programming language in the world. Um, so just to ride that magical, you know, uh, story has, has been exciting. And because of where we were and when, because of OER, we were able to play a role in that. Because how did they, like a computer scientist, ended up on MIT's free software, courseware resources. It was, you know, it was released and remixed. I just watched it. There are now interactive versions online. You can go and see all of the things that just came out of that. Um, <clears throat> making by sharing, we sort of give and you, you get back. It, it, you know, it's a pretty amazing thing. 
And one of the things, another OER uh, that I wanted to give, give a shout out to Dr. Chuck because he took a remix of our book and turned it into Python for everybody. And now he's got a whole series of videos online, all Creative Commons. Um, I end up using a lot of his materials now in the courses that I'm teaching. Um, so again, he, 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 he credits Alan with having inspired him to do this in the beginning. So, so that, that was also very exciting. So that's the story. I mean, I've met people, I've gone to Python conferences, I've had Guido come into my classroom, I've done all of this stuff because open educational resources brought me to, to an open book, which brought me to the Python community, which, and, and it's just been so joyful. I, I think, I don't know that I would still be teaching high school were it not for the joy I get out of being part of all of this process. So I'm, a couple of years from retirement, although if you know I keep having fun, I may never retire. So we'll have to see how it goes. But I have this goal. So I'm part of uh, what's a dual enrolled program. It's a thing we're doing in the US where high school students get college credit. So I'm at a, we offer an associate degree, which is a two-year degree. I don't think it, you, you have it here in the UK, so it's a little different. But we have this community college system all across the US, and it's the first half of a bachelor's degree. And you can do it more affordably at a, at a local school. So I am an adjunct at Northern Virginia Community College because my students, our high school students, also get college credit. And in fact, we offer a, an associate degree in computer science concurrent with high school. Part of this isn't really a good story. It's because it's also it's getting so expensive, higher education. That the, and in the U.S., the only place you have control over education to keep the cost down is public education. So they're pushing higher ed into, into K-12, right? They're pushing it into the high schools because they can do that. So, um, and, and so anyway, um, not all my students are ready, but those that are are getting associate degrees in computer science along with their high school diploma. And the Northern Virginia Community College, which is part of the Virginia Community College system, has rolled out a wonderful new associate. I'm pretty impressed with the, with the work they've done. And it's going to have these five courses and that are part of the associate's degree. And what I want to do, and I'm working on it now, is to produce OER content for that entire curriculum. And uh, I would invite any, any computer teachers here or I'd uh, love to collaborate with you. So that's my quick presentation because I would like to have a discussion with the time we have left. Perfect. 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 So questions, comments, join me later at the bottom. Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, any questions or comments, observations? Yes. We said that the AP test had switched to C++. So is that the case that you got students to start with Python and then they were able to do C++? Yes. I mean, and what, what ended up happening, actually, they only, it was the biggest mistake child support ever made. So they only stayed on uh, C++ for, and then switched to Java after four years. That's Ooh, a goof. But, um, <laughs> Very good. yeah, so I was able to teach the intro course. And do you still do the introduction in Python, or do it, you find Java is okay to start with? Or so, ironically, it's kind of interesting. So, this course right here, Introduction to Problem Solving and Programming, is a full year course, and, and I use Python. Okay. So, so, students get a year of Python, and then object oriented programming we had been doing with Java, but mm -hmm. ironically, I'm now switching back to C++, which, okay. which is not so bad as a second language. Like if you had a year of Python, and there, I mean, it, it, you know, I could go into why. I'm really the goal. I, I view that the goal of this program is to demystify computers because computers are becoming ever, ever more indistinguishable from magic. Students, just, if you talk to it, it does stuff. And, and if you're going to be studying this field, you want to try it, you want to come away with, with some sort of human intuition about 
what is at the root of the machine and how does it work and what, what's it capable of doing. So that's leading me to be able to, I'm actually going back in time and teaching students on an, this thing called the Altair 8800, which was a machine from 1975 that you program with switches. So there's one course where we actually, I actually teach them how to use that computer. It was about the last time an entire computer could fit in your brain. And so that let, and because of that, C is a good language to get closer to the machine. Do you use the turtle with Python? So, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. We use the, the turtle with Python. There's a whole bunch of there developed in the UK, there was something called the Live Wires. I met somebody um, who did a summer camp in the UK, 2007. Also open another whole open source, you know, uh, story. Um, it developed this incredible curriculum for a summer camp because at the time they said they couldn't work computer programming into the high school curriculum here. So they did it as a summer camp. And I took that and adapted it, and we call it GASP, the Graphics API for Students of Python. And my students love that. And that's just a remix of what they developed here uh, in, in, you know, in the, for that program. Thank you. Another question here. Hi, Andrew Smith from European University. So, Jeff, you've got introduction to program, problem solving and program, then object oriented programming. You've got Python and then C. How do the students cope with the transition from Python to C, Java, or any other language? So, it's it's not hard. I mean, in the sense that the, the hard, so there's the first thing you have to do is understand what the computer does and how it works. So then we're sequencing, we're you know iterating, we're branching, and you have to do that in any program because the computer is the computer, and any program language is going to make it do that. So Python is a great, gentle, you know, powerful way to learn that. But by the time they're learning C plus plus, they know that they don't have to struggle with that. Now they have to struggle with this kind of weird language, but then it's different and new, and and they're able to translate. So the syntax, the syntax nuances they. Comfortably, so yeah, I don't. I find that after, like, Python's the way to start, but after that, there's a, a, a the first language is hard. The yeah. jump from the first to the second is pretty small, and you know, people who go into this field learn a dozen programming languages because after a while, you can pick one up in, in a yeah. couple of weeks. In my confession is I'm a computer scientist that used to teach Java programming to beginners, and I used to tell them it isn't case sensitive, it's case. <laughs> right. And uh, whereas Python is a little bit more forgiving. So yeah, where and C is, yeah, you, you can you can set a fire to things with C. Or right. Or it's just good to see that you're yeah, you're making that transition. Well, C is the language that lets you shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. And, and you should when you're learning. Yeah. It usually lets you shoot yourself in the foot by the head as well. <laughs> So there's a question in the back. Yeah, I'm also an experienced teacher in C++, wonderful language. Uh, but we also start with a, a Python course uh, uh, before we go to C++. And I want to see the other questions. If you, also, if you switch to another language, I think it's still important to focus on the programming and not per se on the language. Right. Uh, so most of the books are sort of like dictionaries of the programming language. Right. You should not use those. You should use examples and focus on the program and algorithmic thinking. And then it doesn't really matter which language you use. And especially with C++, I think you should also focus on the subset of the language. Uh, and then people feel comfortable, and then you can go to the edge cases. Uh, so I'm working on this right now. So I think like the computer science will be staying with me, but my entire career. And um, this is another remix of Alan Downey's original book. And it does just what I think, what, just what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm gonna use it for two courses. So I'll use it for our object. Really, in with Python, they'll be learning object-oriented programming already. So this is the, the I'm in a really privileged position because I'm in a cohort. I have a small group of students that I get to see for three years. I get to know them, build relationships with them, and I can integrate the curriculum across the courses, so I don't have to think of it as these like separate things. I can think, well, we already learned that here, so even though it's supposed to be in this course description, I can kind of, you know, block, you know, quickly move over that. So we're going to 
we go through this book, the first semester object oriented programming, the first half of it, but then for data structures and algorithms, linked lists, trees, and all that, I actually want them to use learn pointers. That's another reason for going back to C. Get closer to the Yeah, I, I, I'm from uh, Sri Lanka, I'm brother, and I'd like to approve this too because when I'm learning in 2001, I'm an IT graduate. So uh, first I learned Java, but completely lost with programming when I'm starting with Java. Then they asked us to, uh, like they taught us C++, then all oh, that's good, then I can learn something. Then after that, when after graduating only I learned Python. So <laughs> I, I know that's a, a starting point. So thanks to you and the people who wrote these books, I think nowadays students have more opportunities to learn how with the beginning. So, and also uh, it's very uh, much appreciated that your work and the people who commented here, because uh, learning, like uh, thinking as a computer scientist is very good uh, place to start the program. So just going in <laughs> the place and place, uh, trying to do it. So I think, thank you very much. And it's a good thing. So how was Python after C++? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> So, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I'm Lou Mycroft. I'm not a computer scientist. But I want to appreciate your commitment to community college. Mm -hmm. I love how you use those terms, community college, in these days. Um, I'm from English further education, which is comparable, but we've been made to be businesses for many years now. We've just financially come back into the public sector, and I hope that community college can, can become part of how we think of ourselves. I love that here you're all joined up. Absolutely love that. And I think I just wanted to appreciate that because unless we have people like you, Jeff, who bring your enthusiasm to your passion, which is just so engaging, yeah. and uh, into I think colleges to help heal that, that join and that divide. Some colleges do brilliant pathways to aging, but in many they're quite separate. I just wanted to appreciate how you must be inspiring whole generations. Thank you. You know, it's great to be here. The keynote this morning, mm -hmm. and then uh, Jack's rules of what he wants to see with education. I mean, that's what I've been trying to do, sort of on the, on the, on the fringe, right? I mean, but it, that's what's kept it joyful for me. I mean, my, my, I have the best job in the world, mm -hmm. and it's because I get to do all these things that I have the best job at the moment. Yes. I'm from West Virginia, so practically oh. neighbors. Um, but my exposure to Python is through competitive robotics. And so I'm curious if you have any any experience with using that as like a gateway to get kids more interested in computers. So there's so many things you can do with Python. Um, Adafruit is a company that produces the Circuit Playground Express. So, you know, it's funny. We need to, you know, take the village to raise a child. I'm really not a hardware person, right? So students love it. I love programming because I can predict what's going to happen and it runs every time and I'm not dealing with tolerances and voltages and, you know, things that I find less interesting personally. I, and I'm, I'm more of a humanities person, actually, who happens to be into the computer science. So I want to do a text, not, not circuits. Um, but um, there definitely is. I mean, so with because of microprocessors now and with Circuit Python, you can do a whole lot with robotics, and students do. So it spills over. I teach them the basic uh, programming, and then Python has libraries for anything. Thank you. Sure. Jeff, I'm also a humanities person, but I'm masquerading as a computer scientist some days. Uh, and uh, I wasn't aware of your book, so thank you. I suppose just what a couple of the speakers said, thank you for your work, it's fantastic, mm -hmm. and it's great that it's open source. I was using a book called Teaching Tech Together by Greg Wilson, okay. uh, a Python open access book that's absolutely wonderful. Um, and I guess I just, and, and the other thing to thank you for as well is you didn't mention anything about how we're going to plug gaps in the economy and create programmers <laughs> that are going to, you know, stop China and we need more of these people in STEM and all this kind of thing. So just your passion and just making the work open is, is, a, is a good thing because that's just going to 
uh, it seems like a very welcoming attitude you have to it. Uh, and what are the biggest kind of barriers you find to teaching them programming to students at the moment? What are the things that they're struggling with? So I think this, we, our program is an associate degree concurrent with a high school diploma. So my students come in pretty well prepared by and large. Um, and I, have, I haven't had that many obstacles in terms of actually getting them to be successful in, in the intro course. Some of them go through the introductory course and say, eh, I don't really want to do this associate degree, they switch to something else. But most of them stay and, and they tend to be very successful. I mean, you know, it, for me, it's fraught with contradictions. I'll be honest with you. Um, I, I, I want to do good in the world. And sadly, most of the jobs in the sector are not doing good in the world. So it's like, ooh, what am I really doing with my life? I mean, they're, 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 I, have to, I have to think about that sometimes. But I'm, I'm hoping to start a nonprofit called Social Justice Computing. I'm trying to, there are so many good things we could do with the machines, but there's no money in it, right? So that, that's the sad part. Um, and so it's hard to actually make a living doing good with technology. It's possible, but it's not, it's not easy. But even small things are enough, like even making a book open access to people, it's that that's it's a small thing, but it, it helps people peripherally in some way. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, that, that part has been great. I met people from all over the world, uh, virtually mostly, but um absolutely it's it's been joy fun. Excellent. We've got time for maybe one more question or comment. Otherwise we can let you go slightly earlier. Right. Thank, Thank you, you all. <laughs> So, uh, since you've just executed for the next little year, yeah, yes. so thanks everyone. Uh, your next session starts at 10 to the hour.